Hello, hello, everybody. It is 8.51 p.m. Central Time on the 24th of October 2020, Saturday night here in the United States. And I hope you are doing well. Of course, we are here to talk about seismic events with a surprise evening update for all my viewers who are live on Twitch right now. We're going to record this and then put it over on YouTube with a premiere. Let's get a display capture turned on. And we're going to start really quick over here on the West Pacific with our deep earthquakes. That's where I did my last update. You can see our deep six raised high off the globe here, 6.1. And this alone can cause major activity to spread out and away from the deep earthquake. And around the same time, we saw a six spread over to South America. So let's get those out of there. And this is pretty much everything that struck since our deep six. So we have two new deep fours on our letter D. New Zealand started to move down here right next to Wellington, just north of Wellington, as well as up here on the north tip of the catcher's mitt, the thumb position of the catcher's mitt east of the Bay of Plenty. And just something about this point I'd like to point out, this is the exact antipode of CERN over in Switzerland. So if we were to go straight through the planet and come out on the other side, would bring us out right at, next to CERN at Geneva, Switzerland. Just have to point that out. Pretty weird, right? So up to the west by northwest, we have a 5.2 that struck right after I did my update next to New Caledonia. New Caledonia, in case you don't know it, is this sliver of an island right here. And New 5 striking there. In our open areas from the day before, look, our open areas have been filled in with new upper fours to near five, 4.8, 4.6. So upper fours going across the plate boundary. And I've talked about the plate boundary so many times and so many past updates. It's the thick red line that's on the screen here right now. Oh, and I have something to clear up, by the way. See this earthquake here? Okay, so in my last update, the times weren't matching right it wasn't showing west coast time wasn't showing my time apparently the usgs site on their website shows local time east coast time <laughs> don't ask me why okay i don't know why but shows local time east coast time and so that's why it wasn't showing for me that's why it was showing us off that's why i thought something was wrong so in other words i was wrong all right i removed that part from the video and i'm issuing a public correction now uh, one of my trolls actually pointed that out over on former facebook page by the way, I've got a new Facebook page, which is just Facebook slash Dutch Sense. It's just a page, no follow buttons or news feeds or anything. You just go there to get the latest posts that I make, by the way. So again, Facebook.com slash Dutch Sense. Anyway, over to the west from there, over to the west from Papua New Guinea, we have a stepping stone path of threes all the way across North Indonesia down to South and Central Indonesia. And then look, right in the middle of our area that was open from two days ago, 5.4 earthquake came rolling in. This is right at Java, Indonesia. We also have new eruptions over at Semeru Volcano, which is on the east side of Java. And speaking of that, let's just go ahead and look at the Volcanic Ash Advisory Center, see if anything new is on the list. Mexico, uh, Popocante Patal in Mexico City. A couple times, Ducono in Indonesia, regular occurrence. Sabancaya down in Peru and Reventador in Ecuador, same thing, regular occurrence. But Semeru's back on the list, 13,000 foot high blast. Also, Langila is on the list, and I'll show you where that is. That's over in Papua New Guinea. I want to see if there's any others that are on the list, because, again, we need to see if there's any increase going on. Ah, okay. What's going on with Copahue here? Oh, Copahue had a 10,000 to 14,000 foot high volcanic ash cloud, but it's not identifiable from satellite. I guess, it, let's see, do they have how they were able to see it? Oh, seismic signature on that. Okay. Anyway, let's just show you where these are. Semeru is right here, pretty much where the rings overlap in eastern Java. Then we jump over here where the other sets of rings overlap on our other letter V. That's Mount Ducono. Going over here, Langila Volcano, which is at the eastern pinnacle tip of Papua New Guinea. That's also erupting. Going all the way here to the north, we have Suwanizajima in south Japan. That's Ryukyu Islands. And skip over the rest of the North Pacific, which is a change because we had Kluchevskoy, Shivalush, Ebico, uh, let's see, uh, Bezimiani, all of those erupting. But they stopped 
Meanwhile, the seismic activity in the last day has stopped across the whole northwest Pacific. And you can see our previous earthquake activity equidistantly spaced going across the entire northwest Pacific, and it's all about the same size. 4.7, 4.9, 4.5. And the middle point here is that middle zone. We call that a fulcrum point, and I'll show it to you on the plate boundary map here. This is the USGS map. It's like a letter H shape. And up to the north, down to the south, and over to the west. All three same-sized earthquakes. And that middle point is under serious stress right now. There should be something larger than what's on all three sides, which strikes in the middle point right at this bend that goes across the plate there. As we go up to the north, you can follow that red line on that map I just showed you here all the way up and over into Alaska. And there's a stepping stone path of earthquakes all about the same size going right over into the North American Craton. And that goes into Canada. Additionally, the day before, 4.6 struck at Nunavut, Canada, west of Greenland. But this is a noteworthy increase to go across the area. Here is where our 7.5 earthquake struck earlier this week with a tsunami. Now a spread of 4.7, 4.8 going across, like I said, over to the Craton edge. And you can see the mountain range, which is marked in brown versus the more highlands and plains area and forest, of course, in Canada. But the bends in the plate on the Rocky Mountains that go all the way up to the north. Now, before we get into the continental United States, let's just quickly jump over and go over into Myanmar, India, where a 4.6 struck. You can finally check Myanmar off the list. Also, that 5.1 and another 4.7 from the day before and today. I'd like to point out, though, that the tip of the arrow next to Tehran in the Caspian Sea was filled in with a new 5. And that's a significant sized earthquake in the area. We go back a few days before that. And the southern edge of the plate boundary moved down to the south. I think it was a few days ago. Let's go see if it's still on the feed. Is it even on the feed? The Europeans reported it. It was in the 4 range. So this is definitely a bigger earthquake. But I'm still going to have to watch now, again, back behind it, over in the middle point, right here where the sets of rings overlap. I guess that's Afghanistan now. Over to the west, Italy got hit, as well as Romania. Let's go ahead and show you the activity in Italy. So here is Sicily, Italy, down to the south, the island. Here's the south boot of Italy, and we have 4.4. Why does that matter? Well, we go back just a few days, and there was activity spreading out and across over from Turkey and Greece. We're still watching, and we have two days left to go in the watch, Cyprus. Cyprus should be above 5.0 range. It's on the plate boundary. Let's just show you the plate boundary over in Italy and Europe and Mediterranean. So I have a warning going here at the bend in the plate. We just saw new activity here at the bend in the plate and back across, going across south of Crete and south of Greece which means there should be a new break between our sets of earthquakes here in the South Mediterranean. Regardless of whether an earthquake hits here in Cyprus, again, that's just a few hundred miles off. Over to the west, this is pretty significant. It's a 4.4 down in the Tyrrhenian Sea, but we have to go and look what's just north of Sicily. You'll, when I show you, you'll understand what's going on. Look where we're going in on. Some of the most famous volcanoes on the planet, such as the volcano named Volcano, or Stromboli, the other very famous volcano in the area. We also have Mount Etna just to the south on Sicily's mainland, if you will. But the earthquake is coming in pretty much right here in the volcanic group. So it's just something to pay attention to. It's also on the USGS map. Here, look, here's the plate boundary that goes all the way up into North Italy, okay? So that's the spread of earthquakes that goes across South Europe at this point. In the past few days, it's gone around the eastern edge up to Poland. It's also gone over to the UK. It's gone out towards Iceland and the North Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's also gone down to the south, down to the Canary Islands. I even had people contact me about this, about the Canary Islands, asking me if I thought there was a threat there. And 
Well, I mean, while there's always a threat of an eruption at volcanoes, guys, we will see any kind of seismic activity pick up at one of those, and it would be significant. It would be thousands of small earthquakes that would show up at one of those locations before anything like that would happen, where there's the talk of a volcano splitting in half and <laughs> sending a huge, I shouldn't laugh about that, but sending a huge tsunami all the way over here and inundating the east coast of the United States and the Caribbean with hundreds of foot high waves. Now, we hope that doesn't ever happen. Okay, now I've got to talk about this. Let's get into the United States. Like I said, the edge of the Craton was displaced with 4.0 range activity coming into northern Canada. And it's no doubt about that, 4.7, 4.8. They're two of the same sized earthquakes. And if you take the 4.6 into account, look at the spacing on this. So where our big earthquake was, 4.6 and 4.8. Then in between a 4.8, 4.7, and another 4.6 spread across the whole northern part of the plate. Now to seal the deal on this, let's just turn down all the way to 4.0, or we can even look at 3.7 and greater. You'll see there's a stepping stone path also, also to the south of the United States, starting in Southern California with a 4 or a 3.9 going down to another 4.7. So it's pretty much the same sized movement on both sides of the United States. Now in between, like I showed on the Craton Edge, I have to keep that graphic on for a moment because you have to see how the earthquakes go across the Craton Edge to understand in between, look, it's like a sandwich where we have 4.7s on the north side, 4.7s on the south side, and in between it's squeezing over to the east dropping off all these same-sized earthquakes along the way. Now, I got contacted by dozens of viewers, which actually that's a lot, out here in the middle of Kansas. And they were all asking about this earthquake that struck in Kansas, and they couldn't figure out why the USGS, what, you know, what the USGS was doing, whether or not they were going to, you know, talk about it on the news or not. And they were asking me what I thought about the earthquake, so I decided to go look it up and look at the name of the place that's called Hope, Kansas. Hope, Kansas. What a name. Well, let's go look at the area and tell you what we found. So I went and put the coordinates in yesterday. My viewers on Twitch watched me do this live. Looked up the location. I couldn't find anything at the spot at all. So here's the earthquake epicenter. Looking around, I just saw open fields. I backed it out really far, and I saw that just to the south of the earthquake epicenter down here, there were some pads on the ground. So I zoomed in and they were wind farm pads. So it's not a wind farm causing the earthquake. And I zoomed out of the area and I didn't find anything else nearby, no oil wells, just these wind farm pads. That got me a little suspicious. Whenever I see an earthquake in Kansas, I wanna go look it up and see what's the deal. So I went over to this site here, which has come in handy in the past trying to identify oil drill points around the nation, and in this case, over in Kansas. So we have the whole state of Kansas here, and we'll zoom in on the spot, and we'll just zoom in on just any spot, and it's got all the previous oil wells that have ever been drilled, and the current functioning wells, as well as all the old ones that have been capped off going back to the 1940s. Well, look what I found. Here's the earthquake epicenter. We'll hit search again. And look what's all around the earthquake epicenter. Old, plugged, and some abandoned, but some are just plugged. I guess they still had oil in them. But the depths drilled on this. For instance, the nearest well is just a couple hundred feet away. August 31st, 1978. Plugged oil well, 2,450 foot depth. Drilled right there where the earthquake is. Just about a mile away, we have something from 1963 drilled down to 2,441 feet. Here's one from 1955. Again, maybe 1,000 feet, maybe two, not even a mile, uh, up to the north, July 31st, 1955. And look, as we go around the area, you'll see they get even further back in time. So February 29th, 1944, plugged at 2,476 foot depth. So you go into the area now, and they don't have any kind of oil wells there. You have to go look historically to see, have they drilled there before? And it turns out, not only have they drilled there before, they've drilled right there before, where the 3.0 range earthquake just struck. 
Now we can go down to the south. Let's do that. Let's go pull this 3.3 down to the south because it's about the same sized earthquake. So first we got the earthquake in Kansas at this old oil well drill point. And we can even get the old owner's names, who owned the wells, who had the licenses, everything's on that website, which I'll give you the web address right now. It's up at the top of the screen. It's pretty basic. Maps.kgs.ku.edu slash oil and gas slash index dot html and i'll put the link down below in the description too but that's just read aloud for anyone to retype that in if you need to so 3.3 earthquake where is it let's put the coordinates in oh wait i didn't pull the coordinates i guess i would need to pull those coordinates on the 3.3 before we paste them in there we are oh did i already put them in Ah, silly me, I already put them in and hit search. Let's hit search again. I just missed the zoom in. I was too busy talking. That happens sometimes, guys, when you have the gift of gab. Here we are. So zooming in on the earthquake epicenter. Wait a second. There's another wind farm right here, isn't there? There sure is. Look at that. Another earthquake at another wind farm. Must be related to the wind farm. Oh, wait. Right here all the way around the wind farm. We have a boatload of frack and oil wells. And I can zoom in on the shadow of the jack of the pump on that one. That's oil. And they go down the road and they have the tanks and they have more jacks and pumps. And we can just carry on all the way across the fields, all the way around it too. So it's not like this is the only spot right here where I have the place marks. We could go down and around the wind farm itself most likely and find oil wells nestled either in between the windmills or around them. So they'll do that. By the way, this might be an electrical substation here, yeah. But they'll do that. They'll do the drill points right through the wind farms, at least down in Oklahoma, they will. And we're right next to it. So, again, that's a little suspicious that we have all these wind farm earthquakes when really they're right next to drill points. Wouldn't you say? And we carry on down to the south, and there's more. There's another 3.1 range earthquake that struck at another drill point, and I can pull the coordinates on this to pull and prove. I do this for new viewers who sometimes doubt if you just say it, you need to show it. If Again, it's a bold claim to say that these are all drill points. Look, we got a hot spot right next to there, a flare off point. Hold on. Here's an oil well right here. There's an old abandoned house right next to it, right there. And all of these are oil wells out in the fields here. So when I see a hotspot show up, one, only one in the entire area, or maybe two in the whole county, I want to go see, is there an oil well at the location? There is. There's an oil well directly here with tanks and a burn flare apparatus. Right here on the right side is the smaller little burn flare apparatus, in case they have overpressure at a well. So these hotspots are showing up, burn points where they flare off oil or gas when there's Tremendous pressure, or in this case, we have a lot of seismic activity, which to me says there's probably a fair amount of pressure coming in on the plate, on the craton edge. And then, of course, they have to flare it off. Now, the hot spots on the New Madrid, nothing today. Nothing up in the Northwest. Just checked right before I came on live. Not going to waste your time to show you nothing. Colorado got snow over the location. That's good. Let's go look at the last day's worth of earthquake, 0.0, .0 and greater. And let me get a sip of my drink while it's populating. Doing V8 tonight. V8. I was walking sideways. Now I'm upright. No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm, hey, I'm not shilling for V8, okay? They are not a sponsor. Let's go over on the West Coast. So I already mentioned the 3.0 in Kansas. I already mentioned the threes from yesterday down in Oklahoma. Up in the Northwest, we have a 3.4. The 3.4 right above the deepest part of the magma chamber for Yellowstone. And Yellowstone's magma chamber starts at the surface at Wyoming. And I'd say it in every update. They did new earth penetrating tomography 
measurements over the past several years, VLF basically bouncing off the interior of the magma chamber, and gave them a radar type image of the interior of the magma chamber, which they found out goes down 30 or more kilometers and extends all the way below Idaho. The feeder for the whole magma chamber comes in from below Oregon, and it comes up at an angle where these earthquakes are right above the deepest part of the center of the ma whole magma chamber, which is 11 Grand Canyons in size. Now, it's also on the edge of the craton, where these super volcanoes tend to form either on plate boundaries or craton edges. They have other examples of craton edges where super volcanoes have formed. So we have Yellowstone on the craton edge super volcano there. Also above the deepest part of the magma chamber, we have 3.0 range movement. Same with over in the Midwest on the edge of the craton, but it's at drill points. Same size though, three-ish. Going up to the west-northwest, we need to get into this because something happened this morning. And I don't know if we're going to be able to see it on the satellite. I was going to get on earlier today. I, I don't want to create any more controversy or problems for anybody or give anybody anything more to worry about. So I kind of wanted to wait and see what happened throughout the day. I didn't just want to jump on it and be like, guys, look at this. What's going on up in the northwest? But up in Washington state, I noticed this morning, I was looking at shortwave infrared. And starting early this morning, maybe it will still show up. Yeah, it's still there. So here we go. Right after the satellite cuts out for the night, they've been cutting the West Coast satellite out for the night. They restore it at, after 1200 hours Z, which is 1200 UTC. And I want you to pay attention to right here in southwest washington and hopefully you guys will be able to see this so let's just okay first of all i mean well first of all we have a hot spot that appears and it's been apparently not exactly dry up there so let's just keep that in consideration but i want to draw your attention to right here there's a darker area it's not a spot where you can see through the clouds this is a darker area, which we're looking at shortwave infrared, which means it's slightly warmer than the surrounding air. So it starts, now watch this, it makes a trail that blows in the wind. And again, that's not a clear spot or a shadow or anything. This is, again, this morning. So the sun is coming from the right-hand side of the screen, from the east. So it's not like a shadow or anything. And then it goes and goes and goes. And then right about there, it kind of fades out. But then we get a new little hot spot series of hotspots that pop off, a little black dot that appears there next to it. And then it just, this brings us up to the most current image. It's 7 p.m. out there on the West Coast right now. So this is throughout the day today, though, that, just watch it really quick. You might, maybe I'll do it faster and you can see it. All right. Now, we're going to go look at this in a different view because this is the short wave. Let's go look at the natural color fire view, which just shows us the cloud cover itself. And we'll start at the start of the day again. Here's sunrise. And we're paying attention to this spot right here. Okay. Now up here to the north, this is Mount Rainier. And this spot right here. Well, here. Well, let me just show you first. <laughs> let me show what's going on here before I tell you what's there. Even in the natural color fire view, there's a light. It's a lighter color now. And this so the cloud cover is in a bluish color, and this is more in a white. It's kind of hard to see on this. You, you probably would have to follow along if you're looking on College of DuPage yourself. Let's go to particle size, and this is really where it's going to show on the particle size near infrared. So we're going to start again at the start of the day. Here we are at the morning, sunrise. And we're paying attention to this spot right here. Now watch. Do you see the discoloration on it now? Okay, hopefully you can't. So it's a different color, different particles, and a little bit warmer. And then at the end of the day, you can see right there, both it and up to the north, which is Mount Rainier, are both blowing in a different direction. There's something blowing off of them in a different direction to the south, two streamers coming off of these peaks right Hopefully you can see this. This is the end of the day. This is right here going up to current almost. Okay. Now, we need to go figure out what's at this spot right here. And I can already tell you, I already know. I went and looked it up, but I'm just building up to it because you need to get the shock that I got when I looked this up. So I, I was already fairly certain I knew what was there south of Mount Rainier. 
But just to verify, let's take this back. The spot in question is right here. So our county lines are going to be how we determine what's at the location. And this big, flat county line right here across South Washington, we can just go due north of it right along the other county line and find what's there. That's how we're going to triangulate what's there. We're going to do it by the county lines since we're talking about a big feature. So let's go up to the north. Zoom in. Here's the county. We're going to go due north of there and look where it takes us. Mount Adams. You'd think I was going to say Mount St. Helens, right? No, it takes us into Mount Adams. So up to the north, we have Mount Rainier. Down to the south, we have Mount Adams. And they're both putting off something, but Mount Adams is putting off the significant signature, if you will. And there's no disputing that. It's putting off some kind of signature because my eye is drawn to it, and it's not just wind blowing around the clouds, okay? Even on this, with the county lines on, you can still see it. And it, it's changing direction with the wind, whatever's coming off of there. And there's no doubting it. It's darker on the near infrared right here than the surrounding cloud cover. But when you look at it on human visual, it's lighter in color, which to me says steam. That's what it says to me, steam. Now we can go over on Google Earth. And just look and see if there's any hotspot signatures around the area. There's no hotspot signatures from GOES at all around the whole area. So that kind of lets us know, too, whatever came off of that wasn't too hot. It was more like some kind of steam of some kind. Now, I had to take the time to show that to you before we get into the earthquakes that struck, because look where the earthquake struck. Our first set takes us right down at Mount Rainier. So one of the spots that was putting off some kind of steam or some kind of plume of some kind. We have an earthquake outbreak, not a swarm, but several small earthquakes that have been striking below the crater this week. And we are right below the crater right now. That is where the coordinates for the earthquake took us in, down below the crater. That's where these earthquakes are here, these three. So what about the 0 0.6 up to the east-northeast? Entiat, Washington. Let's put the coordinates in and see what's over at Entiat. And I'm probably butchering the way that is pronounced. Forgive me. I don't speak Washingtonese. <laughs> okay, so here's the earthquake epicenter. And, well, do you guys remember what happened here over the past several weeks? Well, I have one of the place marks here. A large series of fires broke out across this location just east of Glacier Peak Volcano. Enough fire activity broke out here that we were starting to get a little worried that something geophysically might be going on. In light of the other locations down to the south, this spot, Hanford Nuclear Facility, having a series of earthquakes around it around the same time. So earthquakes up here, fires up here. Earthquakes down here next to the nuclear processing facility where fires happened last year. And earthquakes happened last year. So earthquakes went around this place last year and fires broke around this place last year. Now, this year, earthquakes go up to the north and down to the south and fires break out right next to it again. And that's where we are. So up to the north, a 1.0 earthquake. Let's go check this out. What's going on there? Langford, Canada, 18.5 kilometer depth. Down below Victoria, well, let's see. I'm going to say this is more likely related to the slow slip that has been taking place up here. The episodic tremor slip, which appears to be dying down. Let's go see what's going on today. 100 across southwest Washington, southwest Oregon, and northwest California. Three pockets. Two of the pockets on the southern arm of the Juan de Fuca fracture zone. You can see it out here in the ocean. It's like a letter M shape fracture zone with two arrows, northern arrow pointing in up here and southern arrow pointing in down here. And we can see it better. We can see the northern arrow point at least a little bit better on the USGS map. There it is. So here's the Juan de Fuca fracture zone on the north side. And it points into where we're shimmying and shaking and shifting across Vancouver Island. Hot spots appeared all the way across Vancouver Island. 
and in the past day, we haven't seen any. It went from everything to nothing, which further lets us know that it's not just some farmers burning their fields. Now, I have not really checked today, so I would like to go look today and see for sure, is there anything showing in the past few hours on the Olympic Peninsula, Vancouver Island, or in Southwest Canada? And we'll just let this load throughout the day today. There's one spot down here, a little black dot flaring on and off. We have another spot up here in Canada flaring on and off, and another spot here that's showing. Okay, we have three spots showing. Let's go up to the north. When I see one spot that's going, I want to go look up to the north. Do we have anything going across Canada? Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Look at what's on the screen. Guys, look at this is today. Watch this. So the satellite kicks off. Oh, no, it doesn't. This satellite doesn't kick off. This is in the morning. Kicks off right here. The flames go crazy. Or the flames. The hot spots go crazy. I don't know if these are fires. They all appear within just an hour of each other. Starting at 1600, 1600 UTC today. Right here in the middle. One. And then by... 17 to 1800, so that's two hours. And this brings us up to current. This is the most current right here. Now that's full cloud cover. So that's showing through cloud cover. Let's go look at natural color fire view. Ooh, you can see the glowing on these. Now, I don't know if you'll see the glowing on this on the stream. Here's today, throughout the day, Oh, you can see smoke on these. There's here, here, and here. There's trails of smoke coming off of these. That is just... Okay, so we have actual fires now out there. And we have a hot spot showing up right here along the coast. This is Haida Gwaii as a point of reference. This is Haida Gwaii up here as a point of reference. We have a bunch of hot spots going on east of Haida Gwaii, all the way from the coast up to the east by northeast. And there's now no doubting that. We can look at it on shortwave and see the most current image right here. All these little black splotch, splotches. So Haida Gwaii, starting to the south of it, going all the way across, over across the border. Let's go see what's there. Starting south of... <laughs> look... The Millbank Sound Group, starting there, going up across the east part of the t -Sax River Cone through the Hokum Range over here. And we know what's over here. Let me zoom in and see if I can find some. See all these? This is all oil and gas. Here, you can even see with this low-resolution imagery, you can see the shadow of the jack of the pump there. That just lets you know, and look how many there are. Every one of these is a different oil well. So they've really drilled the heck out of this thing, the edge of the plate over here in Canada. I don't know how far it goes over to the west. Let's go over to the west and follow it. Oh, yeah, look, it just carries on across. Wow, I didn't know that it carried on this far. I didn't. I really didn't. Let's go see how far it goes. These are all drill points. Every one of these is a drill point for oil and gas, pipelines, etc. Uh, do we keep going to the west? Yep. Yep. Keep going to the west. How far do we go? It looks like it kind of stops right there. Am I right about that? Or do we keep going? Looks like it stops right about there. Back up right through here is like where it trails off with the wells. Well, that's right. I mean, come on. Okay, so that it literally trails off right there. And our hotspots come right over across, over down to the Millbank Sound Group and go as far north. So all of this is showing hotspots. Again, I'm looking for drill points that would help explain why there's hotspots there if they're flaring off or something. But I don't see major pumping operations across this area. All I see are volcanoes. 
It would be better if we saw drill points, quite frankly. Wait, what's this? Man, that is so blurred out, you can't even see. There's something at each spot, but it looks like it's been blurred. Do you see that? Something at the center, it's got like a blur splotch on it. Let's go over here. Maybe that's not blurred. I mean, that, those are piles or something at the center of each one. Maybe that's for logging, forestry. Again, I'm trying to find to see if there's any drill points here around the area because that would explain the hotspots that are in the location other than the volcanoes that are there. And we don't want to think about that, do we? Or do we? It's a real pain in the you-know-what if that is what is going on. So all of this, hotspots across over to the drill points, which, again, the hotspots then carry on over to the east. It also could be that this imagery is not as new as I'd like to think it is. I don't even know where the date is on this. It says 2020 Google, so you think that would be updated imagery, but they probably do a flyover here once every 10 years or something. So we'll have to wait and see. If this carries on, there's too many of them. I know there's no major drill points across Vancouver Island where we had all the hotspots two days ago. So let me just explain. We had a bunch of hotspots down here to the south at Vancouver Island here a few days ago. Now we have hotspots up here going from the coast all the way up and across the border up into the next province. Why does it matter? Well, the plate is shifting. We get back to the PNSN tremor map here, and they show 108 tremors as of yesterday. Southwest Oregon, going down into California, down here, and Southwest Washington, up here on the north side. Going back over the few days, they've actually decreased. It's the last three, four days, it's gone down, down, down. We had many more happening several days ago, going back to like the 18th, there's 379. Go back to the 11th, there's like 600 every day. So now that it's going down, the number of earthquakes or the number of tremors is decreasing. I would say that means that's going to release energy into the plate. And lo and behold, all of a sudden, old drill points from the 1950s and 1940s start to break in the middle of Kansas, in the middle of the Great Top. The hot spots, as far as I can tell, ceased. So nobody can say it's farmers burning their fields because, I mean, it's late October. This is harvest time now for most of the country. And there's no hot spots across the New Madrid seismic zone. Zero. And again, you can't explain that with other than the plate has now shifted in a way that's not allowing for the heat to release on the New Madrid, at least as far as I can tell. Let's go look. Let's go look today. The only way to find out is to look, guys. And... We'll look live. I want to look and see if we find anything live. This is live on Twitch. You'll watch it back on YouTube, okay? <laughs> Long story on why we don't stream on YouTube anymore. Okay, let's go back. Start of the day. Here we are, start of the day. So previously, we were seeing thousands of little dots across the entire area here, right? Just through the New Madrid Seismic Zone. Then all those arc points on the power line showing across the south. Well, I don't see anything there today, and it's it's light cloud cover, so we should see any tremendous hot spots through that light cloud cover. We should, and I don't see anything. But let's go over and see if there's any detected that are being filtered out. Well, hold on. Look at this. There's no hot spots being detected down here in the New Madrid Seismic Zone. Instead, we go right over to the Wabash Valley Seismic Zone. And these are all detected today in a cluster. Let's go see what's there. Do we have power lines at these locations? Let's go see. What could be down at these hot spot signature locations. There's farmer's fields. Uh-oh. The farmer conspiracy carries on. Let's go over in this. Wait. That's not a farmer conspiracy. That's an oil well. Right there in Indiana. That is. 
that's 100%. I bet there's more. Where there's one, there's more. That's an oil well right at the location. Now, Indiana is known for having oil pumping operations. I just don't have it marked here. Where there's one, there's more. Let's go see. Yep, look at the pipeline substation on this thing. That's not for water, guys. This is oil and gas. Okay, the pipeline substation there as well. That's granary. More granary. Oh, you got a pipeline substation that big. You got a pretty big pumping operation here nearby somewhere. That's just cleared farm field. Oh, man. I'll, I'll tell you what. One is enough. If I find one and I find a pipeline next to it, that lets me know we've got ourselves a pumping operation. So I'm going to put a place mark on it at this point. Let's just do that. Oh, wait. Is there another one? Yep. Hey! Ah, you stick around long enough. Hey, doubters? Who, who's a doubter? There's got to be somebody in here. If not in here, certainly on YouTube. Certainly on YouTube, there'll be somebody in there like, Oh, I, I don't know about that. That, I don't know about that. That looks like a little pad. I, I, I don't see any oil well there. Oil well. All right, there we go. So where there's one, there's more, right? So let's go up to the north and just go see. Is there one right down here at the fire centroid detection? Or is this a farmer burning their field? Ah, uh, Bubba and his brother Daryl and his other... Ah, uh, nope, nope, nope. We got another got another pipeline with the flare apparatus. You can see the shadow of the flare apparatus here. I wonder if we have a street level on this. Hold on. Bubba, Daryl, and his other brother Daryl, and his other brother Daryl are out there doing target practice, blowing things up. That's what it is. Okay, so we got an oil well right there, or at least a, another pipeline. So they're going to flare that off if there's any kind of overpressure that's coming in or any kind of shaking that's detected in that or movement. <laughs> oh boy, that gets into a whole nother can of worms. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. Let's go and keep going on. So we're at a pipeline there, two oil wells there. What about over at Newberry? Granary. Now, oh, that's a pond of some kind. Retention pond and a microwave tower. We got a town there. We got a town there. Oh, boy. Well, where there's a town, if you got a fire detection site, it's on a lake. Right at a lake. Now, there's got to be one nearby. Like I said, where there's one, there's more. There could also be that they're doing extraction there now, which is a new drill point, which they will flare off. I know that for a fact. They'll drill, they'll hit something, get in there, and flare it off for a few days, few weeks. Boy. I think I found enough, though, haven't I? I mean, finding three or four is enough. It just seals the deal that we're dealing with hotspots here at the oil wells. In Indiana. I wonder how close to the New York border we go. Or to the New York. I the Illinois. Boy, there's a Freudian. They're both the same, aren't they? <laughs> What's down at this epicenter? This hot spot epicenter. That is. Farmers fields again. Boy, wait. Hold on. Look what goes right through the farmers fields. High tension power lines. Going right through the farmers fields. Here, let's get out of the red centroid so you can see. We're directly on a power line now. So we have arcing of a power line to top it off. <laughs> oh my God. All right, I just keep... Look, you can add each one of these things to my portfolio of strange discoveries. The hot spots at the oil wells and the hot spots at the arc points. Arcing being something that happens on an electrical power line when there's maybe a crossing of wires... Or maybe there's some kind of geophysical phenomenon taking place in the area that's overloading the lines. Wouldn't that mean there'd be a new earthquake in here, maybe? Indiana? Ohio? Illinois? Some kind of earthquake coming there? I don't know. 
Again, I don't have previous examples to go on on this. This is all new uncharted waters for me. I'm going to watch. I'll tell you that. I'll watch right now over the next several days. I mean, look at the bend in the plate. The spot where this is happening is right there on the edge of the craton. Okay, so recapping. Lines of earthquakes going across the edge of the craton, but today it's all centered pretty much on the west coast with just a pocket in the middle of the plate. Over to the east, we have hot spots, electrical phenomenon taking place. That's over in Indiana and Illinois, which would be extremely rare if we get an earthquake over there. I mean, maybe once or twice a year, you might see some small earthquake activity over there. So, I don't know what to make of it, other than to tell you, I'm going to watch it. What size? I don't know. We'll see, right? It's the... How many licks does it take to get to the center of the Tootsie Pop? One, two, three, three. I mean, it could just be a three, like the rest of the threes going across the plate. Let's go over here on the West Coast and just make note. No earthquakes reported out of Oregon. While there is shimmying and shaking taking place, which I've already showed you like twice or three times in this update, here, these little red dots as the plate is shifting. Slow slipping, but... It's coming to the end of its slow slip, or it looks like it. It could flare back up, but all three states, Washington, Oregon, and Northern California, as well as the Canadian province going into Vancouver Island, all shifted. In the past three weeks, let's say, let's just put it at a three-week time, it shifted for three weeks straight. It's still going today, but just 100 little shimmies. But on the north side of here, all the hot spots. On the south side of here, earthquakes going down in a line across California, flowing out of the Juan de Fuca. And the number of earthquakes went up over the past several days. The frequency of the earthquakes went up. So like a rolling snare drum, the tempo increased. Now we were at zeros and ones with a few twos and a couple threes mixed in. Now each one of our swarm locations itself is going up into the 2 to 3 range. So that means not only did the frequency or the number of earthquakes increase, but now the power behind it is starting to slightly go up. So if we were doing a snare drum roll slight lightly, it's now picked up to a heavy snare drum roll. The bass drum has not kicked in yet. So the highest we're going, for instance, is 2.9, highlighted in blue here on the screen. So I'd like to encourage you to watch along with me in the next few days as we watch for the energy to come out of the Juan de Fuca, where it's been building for the last three weeks, and shifting and pushing into the Craton Edge, which goes over to Idaho, down through Colorado, down through Texas, down through Oklahoma, and back up the East Coast. So it should flow, and it should flow down through California. And last week's forecast for California completely flopped. But, as I said last week when I issued the forecast, it all hinges on the slow slip. Is the slow slip going to carry on, or is it going to release the energy, the shift? You cannot move three states without moving the areas on the north side and the south side. So three states moves, Washington, Oregon, Northern California, and Vancouver Island. Then the area on the north side has to compensate. And the area on the south and east side on the Craton has to compensate, has to absorb that energy, that movement. And it's been announced by the professionals that all three states now, Washington, Oregon, Northern California, and Vancouver Island, have all shifted four to six millimeters this past week, out towards the ocean, that all of this, let's go back to the red dots here on the tremor map, everywhere where the red dots are, to the west, has shifted to the west by four to six millimeters, tearing, if you will, to the west. So it's shifted to the ocean by four to six millimeters in one week's time, seven days, which is a tremendous amount of shifting for a short period of time. It's not like we're talking weeks, months, years. 
We're talking a few days. And we saw all those little tremors, those little red dots, which accompanied that. But don't kid yourself. You can't shift across there four to six millimeters out to the ocean and not have compensation on the north side. Hey, hot spots. And to the south side, hey, earthquake increase going down across California. And the number of earthquakes and the power behind it has increased at each point. So, for instance, this spot here where the 2.9 is, Anderson Springs. Interesting because it's the largest earthquake of the bunch, but if you click on the smallest, look where it takes you. The geysers. It's like they're trying to hide that it's at the geysers, right? Clicking on the 2.9 takes you to another location. Slightly different named, different coordinates because it's based on a different town, Dutch. Don't you know? Okay, not going to complain. Just saying. So let's go look. Here's the earthquake epicenter, the 2.9, and swarm breaking out across this whole hillside. And these are geothermal turbines on the side of a volcano. Now, wait a second. On the side of a volcano, yesterday we were looking up here on the thermal view of Mount Shasta. And this just caught my eye out of the blue. I had never seen it do this before. Some people were trying to tell me that's just the sun. Just the sun. I said, okay. Well, we should be able to see it tomorrow then. So let's go see. Do we see it? Here's Mount Shasta up here on the north side of California. I'm going to go look at the shortwave infrared. And what we're going to look for is, does it show up as a dark splotch? Because yesterday, it showed up as a slightly warmer area where the other areas around it were cooler. Hey, we have hot... Wait! Look, wait, wait. Okay, first of all, it is warmer today and it does go i will say that it goes with the daytime i'm trying to see it from the eyes of a skeptic but as i'm looking at it from the eyes of a skeptic look what i see going on down here in the middle of the valley around sutter buttes look a flurry of hot spots each one going five minutes look at that five minutes five minutes five minutes flare off look at that and a flare-off over here at the California-Nevada border between Lake Tahoe and Pyramid Lake. Let's get that on here. Right there. So, a hot spot there, a whole cluster here. Let's go turn on our natural color fire view. See what's going on throughout the day. Oh, there's smoke with that. There is. There's no way they're going to be doing any kind of burning here just by chance. Like, do you think they're going to let them do burning right now in California for anything? Do you know what's right here in the middle of the valley? I mean, there are a bunch of farm fields. There are. I know there are some farm fields there, but... Hey, wait a second. Look what happens up here. Watch this. This is Northern California today on a clear day towards this afternoon. Watch. It just... A burst of steam northwest of Pyramid Lake. It actually goes across a good portion of Nevada, too. Look at that. They all burst off at once. That's not that's coming from the ground, guys. So, you know how we know it's coming from the ground? For instance, right here, you can follow the shadow of the cloud going back down to the ground. This happens in five minutes. Five, five, ten, fifteen. You see it burst off, shadow on it, poof, expands, goes away, gone. So let's go figure out what's there. We are northwest of the body of water, northwest of Pyramid Lake. I got to go investigate, guys. Real-time discovery. This is just this afternoon. Here's our hot spots across the fields there, detected by goes. you got to be kidding me. Wow, hey, hold on, look, what, look what's there. Look what's there. Twin Buttes and Observation Peak... Heavy Mountain, Dow Butte. Volcanoes are all the way across here. Here's that little body of water. Here, let's go compare. This is that body of water. Or no, I'm sorry. This is that body of water. So it appears between these two. Let's go see. Hmm. Wow. 
I, I, that's the only thing that I can see that's there. We have a series of volcanoes in between the two. There's no disputing that. It's just a matter of, do you think that the steam came from the volcano? That's it. You say, well, what about up to the north, Dutch? Up to the north, that's right next to Mount Shasta, where the hotspot was appearing. Then we have confirmed hotspots with smoke coming from this area, which is directly next to Paradise, California. Let me show you on Google Earth what's there. Here are our hotspots. Here is Oroville. Here is Paradise. Here's our farm fields. Here's our volcano. And starting at the volcano on the south side, they've got it drilled for oil and gas. And geothermal, but oil and gas mainly. And they have flare apparatus in the center of these pads or on the sides of to flare it off in case there's any kind of emergency, letting us know that it's gas and oil. Now, are they up here in the north? That's the only question. <laughs> oh, man. I don't even want to go there. I don't, I, not that I don't want to visit there. I mean, I don't even want to talk about it. So 1.1 earthquake and a 1.1 earthquake, one in the middle of the area in between Lake Tahoe and Pyramid Lake, and another over to the west of. Let's go pull the one to the west of. Canyon Dam, California. Let's go paste the coordinates in. What a mess. Dude, what a mess. Okay, so where are we? Lake Almanor, of course. Lake Almanor. And this is where we were yesterday, right down here at this county line that goes between Paradise and Oroville. Now, we're at the foot of the lake, which both are at the foot of Mount Lassen. Mount Lassen, the stratovolcano. And if I see an earthquake next to a stratovolcano, I associate it with the stratovolcano. Now, the 1.1 over to the east, that's pretty far away. That's in the middle of a giant oval shape, which I've talked about for four and a half, five years. Here, this, which is sandwiched between Lake Tahoe and Pyramid Lake, has two deep fold basins on either side filled with water. It has two geothermal fields on either side of it. Steamboat Springs to the south end. The needles at Pyramid Lake up here to the north. And in between them, the giant oval shape is lined with other smaller volcanoes. It gets hit with earthquakes around the outside edge of it. And in the middle. And that to me says it's a caldera. Unmarked by the professionals. Unknown. So recapping one more time, guys. A line of quakes coming down the northern part of the San Andreas, dead ending into geysers. Over here, we have a 1.1. That's taking us directly next to a volcano. And that's, of course, Mount Lassen. And then over here, we're in the middle of our supervolcano caldera again. For the thousandth time. A line of quakes starting at Monterey Bay, going down the creeping section of the San Andreas, and bringing us into Park Field, California the earthquake capital of North America, where we stop with the earthquakes. Stop at Parkfield. Well, I don't know why they call themselves the earthquake capital when it's the destination point. But it's not the final destination. See where the star is? That's on the red line. That's the San Andreas. But next to it is called Colinga. Colinga. So the earthquakes go down to Colinga, basically, and stop at Parkfield, Colinga. Why? Something begins at Colinga. Here's Colinga. And they're not doing coal extraction here. That's from the railroad days, the name. These are all oil wells. Now, I've shown you a lot of oil wells in this update, haven't I? Over at the Indiana border region, we got hot spots. Over here, we've got earthquakes. Over in Kansas, we've got oil wells going back to the 1940s and 50s. You think I got some kind of beef with oil? I don't. It's just where the earthquakes are striking. There's a huge denial about the drill points leading to earthquakes. Well, here's another spot. This is the San Andreas now where you go right up to it with drill points. Just a couple miles, a few miles. And that's actually far, right there. That's far apart because they bring it down, the drill points, to the San Andreas. This is the San Andreas, and this is one of the pumping operations. Do you see? I mean, come on. Just tens of thousands of drill points right next to it. It goes all the way back up this way with all of these. And the whole mountain range has been done this way. All of these. Just keep going. 
going, 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 going. They're over here, there's more. Okay, you get, you see how many there are? It, it's what I call excessive overdrive. You do that much drilling along something, it's going to perforate it. Even if it's totally a solid piece of stone. So a line of quakes comes down to where the drill points start. And then look, down here at the southeast tip of the valley. Guess what's down at the southeast tip of the valley? More drill points. So we make a diagonal line from where the drill points start, and we go down to where the drill points stop. It's like a conveyor belt or direct conveyor line going from up here to Kolinga, and a diagonal line down to the southeast, and we dead end down here next to the Garlock Fault, which is another oil field. And it's massive. This thing is huge. It goes through the farmer's fields. How many times are we going to say farmer's fields? Take a drink if I said farmer's field. Let me get us at my V8. Starting to sweat, man. I got some energy. So, <laughs> let me take off my bathrobe. Hold on. Yes, I'm sitting here in my bathrobe. Damn. Oh, that just woke everybody up. ASMR. Wow, that was loud. I even heard that. And I'm not even listening. Wake up, everybody! Let me bang around the microphone some more. Listen. All right. That really knocked out here. There. That's some bass. That's bass for you guys. Okay. Uh, we're, we're having fun now. Did I get your attention? Because look, we're at another oil field. I'm just going to keep repeating this. We have a line of earthquakes that goes to our oil field. A line of earthquakes that goes to this oil field. We've got a line of earthquakes that goes to that oil field. They're all on the edge of the craton or on the edge of the plate in weak points that we wouldn't really want to perforate. But they did. And there's lines of earthquakes that go along from point to point. This was apparently controversial to discover. Because when I found it, the professionals went into spin mode can't happen not related you're this and that i even got called a tree hugger which i take offense to because i actually was cutting down trees for a living for the last several years not i stopped actually last year but two years ago now actually no last year and uh, so i was cutting down trees i wasn't hugging them although i would hug them to carry them away now, over here along the California-Nevada border, the number of earthquakes has dropped off at Long Valley Supervolcano and at Monte Cristo Hills Volcanic Buttes. The number of earthquakes dropped off here and picked up down to the very far south in Southern California. There was a transfer that went down across Ridgecrest, down across the Mojave Desert, and dead ended into Southern California with a new swarm. Dozens, if not a hundred, small earthquakes as well as a significant sized 3.9. But you might notice something here. A new stack of earthquakes has appeared today. In, I mean, it's, you, do you think I'm psychic or something? Maybe you do. If you do, you need to get your head checked because I don't know what's going on. It's very scientific here. It's my time machine. So here we are in Corona, California. We have a new swarm that broke out. And I told a story in my update yesterday about how someone sent me a birthday present from Corona, California. All my personal information printed out, including my personal phone numbers and emails, and told me I may need to watch my back as they sent me that. And I, again, I appreciate that as a birthday present. But let me just serve that back nice and hot up on a silver platter here for you. Here's the earthquake epicenter, and guess what's right next to the earthquake epicenter at Corona, California? We have an oil pumping operation. Oil and gas. So how many is that? Am I going to show you? Another swarm next to another oil pumping operation, and that's just where we start, right here. Now let's go down to the southwest. Let's go over here into L.A., because this is taking us down into the L.A. basin. Norwalk, California at a 7.4 kilometer depth. So what's there? I don't know. Let's go see. This is the first time I've looked up this quake. I don't know exactly what's there. There's the epicenter. Ooh, an industrial area. Very nicely done. 
and we've got a lot of industry here of course we've got some residential right next to there looks like a little bit of shipping going on throughout the area but whenever I see something like this I really start to wonder are there nearby oil wells you know they'll nestle them out here into the backs of buildings and on the sides of buildings they'll even put like a little berm around areas where they have drill points like for instance you know this looks like a an area where they might have some oil and gas maybe previously done here and it not the tanks that's going to be for water storage but uh, just when I see something like this I start to look around to see if there's any old former wells but the reason I'm even looking even for old former wells at all is because right over here are the new wells so the new wells go right up to the edges of the subdivisions and they go down they, they kind of do them a little nicely and neatly here but they do them nonetheless let's just zoom in and show you a few that's an oil well right there going down the road you've got more right here and they're just all over the hillsides here and they go over to the west at least as far as the subdivisions there and so we're just a hop skip and a jump I mean we are just quite literally a couple miles away and I know for certain I know for certain they used to do drilling right through here and that there's still wells there because viewers contacted me and told me hey all you have to do is look off such and such street and I went and typed it in and drove down the street on street level view couldn't find jack squat so every time I come in here I'm going to find them at some point but as it stands right now we at least have one oil well patch right across the valley here and that's within the distance that I always look I always look six to ten miles Brea that's not La Brea guys see I see you in chat talking about that that's not the La Brea tar pits this even looks to me like something that was an old oil pop pumping operation maybe a landfill but I'm speculating at this point but it's just a matter of miles it doesn't really matter I just want to get it down to a fine point the other 1.4 brings us in right next to it La Habra Heights that was one of the names that was on the streets right there that I was just showing you let's show you paste and search so while one doesn't take us directly to a pumping operation the other does do you see why I'm looking this is the earthquake epicenter for the other quake and look it's right next to the oil wells and I'm not exaggerating there's one right there at the top of the hill so they're related that's why I look them up swarm here oil pumping operation Corona California swarm here La Habra Heights oil pumping operation just south and just west of it by a couple miles in each direction up here next to an oil pumping operation up here next to an oil pumping operation back up here Parkfield right next to Colinga's oil pumping operation but then the earthquake spread across the creeping section of the San Andreas and meet back up with the drill points at the volcano up here at geysers the volcanoes hit along the California Nevada border going right down to the super volcano the only spots that I have left to talk about are right here Ridgecrest which is next to a volcano and a spot where they drilled for steam and down here in the middle of the Mojave Desert Ludlow California Pisgah crater gold mine but it's at 4.7 kilometer depth are they down that far in the crust could you imagine four kilometers down in the crust I don't think they are but here's our earthquake swarm location right I mean what else do we have going through here what's that what's this oh wait a pipeline look at that what do we have a pipeline there for <laughs> where is that going let's go on let's follow the pipeline see where it goes acquiring minds want to know where does the pipeline go Wow Wow it just keeps going this is the Energizer bunny pipeline look at that here's this <laughs> geothermal hold on hey geothermal that's a geothermal pipeline that's going to a geothermal plant that that pipeline along that way there that those are geothermal turbines Wow who would have thought 
moving steam that far. That's amazing. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, you need to learn something new every day. You got the geothermal pipeline going all the way across the state lines there. So let's recap. Now, again, I got a little distracted there, but going down across, the only spot that I did not show is Ridgecrest, and that's the volcanoes here at the center. Do I need to show the volcanoes at the center of it all? Here. Line of earthquake starting at Kozo Volcanic Field. Devil's Kitchen, as this place is named. Seriously, that's the name. And the earthquakes go in a diagonal line down on the east side of this volcanic peak called Volcano Peak, creatively. And the line of earthquakes dead end down past Ridgecrest into the Lava Mountains here at the Garlock. The Garlock Fault goes back down in a pointy arrow tip into the San Andreas and carries on down to the south. So that's where the other earthquakes are. We have one lone microquake the smallest of the small out here in south nevada let's go look it up and see what's there hey look i mean i get a microquake out in the middle of nowhere what's going on i'll leave it put on my sherlock holmes hat and go see what's there come along with me ah elementary my dear watson Skull Mountain Volcanic Butte. What's this? Looks like an old town of some kind. Let's go turn on our imagery and our Google Earth community and find out what the name of the... Tombtown. The town too tough to die. The original effects test area and close cousin to Survival Town 1 and 2 the, and the town in the third Indiana Jones movie where they blew it away. Operation Rise Line. You may have heard of that. And all of these are underground nuclear test sites. So we can just find a crater and click on it and get the info usually. Hold on. U.S. Nuke Operation Embudo. June 16th, 1971, 18 kilotons. They go up into the thousands of kilotons, which are megatons. And they cover this entire area all the way up to here, where the U.S. and British and French... For instance, Brits, Brits, oh, stiff up, stiff up a lip, oh boy, 89 kilotons. Why are you doing that over here? Oh man, ah, we're best of friends. This is what best friends do for each other. Okay, so a small earthquake out there next to the nuke test sites. It's man-made faulting. The reason that the nuke test site's getting hit is the same reason that the geothermal pumping operation down here at Ridgecrest is getting hit, or at Kozo Volcanic Junction. For the same reason that the oil pumping operations are getting hit. For the same reason that the faults in between those points are getting hit. There's a saturating force that comes into the plate, and it seeks out these weak points. I tried showing this to professionals. They were not listening. But there's an equal spacing of earthquakes going all the way down and across an area, saturating an area, the plate boundary, for instance, the thick red line, and going across the California-Nevada border in a diagonal line as well, following the same trajectory going back up to here, which we know is shifting. And that takes me back to the start of the update with the hot spots all the way up here on the north side of Vancouver Island on the edge of the Craton. Hotspots moving. So moving hotspots, they're shifting around over the course of days. Idaho, up into Canada, down into the United States, back up into Canada, or all at the same time. That's also happening too. But the earthquakes are accompanying it, and they're spreading out across the plate. The diagonal line of quakes here connects into the diagonal line of quakes here, which connects back up to here, back over to here with the diagonal line of quakes, all going in the same direction, northwest to southeast. Goes back up to here, and back up to here. To the Juan de Fuca Fracture Zone. Keep in mind, Mount Adams doing something. I don't know, I don't know what to make of it. There'll be some, but some weather egghead is going to weigh in, and they're going to say, oh, it's just accumulation, a, a condensation from a rising gradient on the side of the volcano, blah, blah. Okay, all right. If we get any earthquake there, I'm going to come back and correct you. 
And if no earthquake strikes there, then I guess you're right. And I'll correct myself. But I'm watching, and I see a plume come from it. While the plate's shifting, and it's starting to slow down, the slow slip was going fast. Four to six millimeters in a week. The whole plate actually physically moved four to six millimeters out towards the ocean. Doesn't that mean there's going to be some breaking and tearing on land? Doesn't that mean there's going to be some compensation? Can't move four to six millimeters one way without getting four to six millimeters movement in the other. Just, again, it, it just stands to reason that's what we look for. So let's go turn back on our 24-hour feed, or turn on our 7-day feed. Turn off the 24-hour feed. Wait for it to populate here. Okay, all right, sorry guys, and there we go. So now we're looking at the last seven days worth. And there's one final point I'd like to make about all of this. That the activity increase that's taking place directly accompanies multiple deep 6.0 range earthquakes over the last week. We had our big deep six last week. And now this week, we have a 7.6 and tsunami up in Alaska. We have sixes going across the plate over into South America. We have an equal spread of the same sized earthquakes, 5.0 and greater, going around the whole planet at this point. There's only one spot to fill in that I see, really, that's connecting between the areas. That would be in Asia. Then we'd have a direct connection going from Europe back across Asia, back down and across, over, back down, across, over, back down, up and around, and over and back up and connect back in. That the whole planet has shifted with this at the center. Again, where our deep earthquakes are hammering in at the center, underneath the plate boundary, which I can show to you on the USGS map here again a little bit better. Hammering in here, then spreading out all the way over to Europe, spreading out around and up and over into Alaska, spreading across in two directions, in this case going north of South America and south of South America. That's exactly what happened. So look at it this way. We have to back out the planet this far. We're, looking, we're only looking at 5.0 and greater. Let me take it on to 4.9. Why does that matter? Because they take a lot of the 5s down to 4.9s. And the 4.9s just, all they do is fill in the areas somewhat in between our 5s. Now if I take it down to 4s, you'll see the 4s certainly fill in the middle points between our sets of 5s. And then it really becomes the whole planet has shifted all the way up and over, all the way back down and across, over to South America and back, on both sides of South America, going to the north and around, and going to the south and around. There, again, you should be able to see this. I, this is seven days worth of earthquakes, 4.0 and greater, or 4.1 and greater. Here is, there is 4.0. There's 4.0 and greater. So it just added a few more in, actually. Okay, so there's a few spots in between them that need to be filled in. Take it down to threes. And you should get a three-point something here on the English Channel. Get a three... USGS ignored these quakes. That's why you're not seeing them. But three-point something on the English Channel at north coast of France. Over here at Poland, a three-point something. And a four-point something earthquake that struck yesterday. Here at Romania, again, USGS leaving all those earthquakes out, just totally ignoring them, like they don't exist. And if you could pull them up on a feed now, you would get a connection across the area. But I swear to you, they're not reporting it because they don't want you to see a connection of earthquakes going across anything. Even the Craton, they denied this. They denied, one more time, I got to drive this point home, man, this is a big deal to me. The earthquakes go across the Craton, there is no doubt in it. You can see it. They cluster up on the west coast. Wait, hold on, let me show it to you without all the magnitudes on here. They cluster out on the west coast in almost a ring shape, but they follow the arrows perfectly, especially up in Montana. And it goes down into Montana, into Yellowstone, and then carries on down through south Texas and back up the east coast. That is the Craton Edge, the interior portion of the plate. When I showed this to professionals, they mocked and ridiculed me. They literally ran me off. And I came back and tried to show it to them again and again and again over many months and years. And it ended up with just straight denial, saying it was chance or coincidence. That's what they said. Well, 
We know it's not chance or coincidence, and only a fool would say that at this point. So it matters, because why does it matter so much? Because if there's a flow, which there is, that goes across the craton in the United States, for instance, and it does it in Europe and everywhere else this way too, that you should be able to determine the angle of the flow and which way it's flowing. It's just like a flow over a river. And that turns everything they ever said on its head, where they said it couldn't flow. There was no relation between anything across anything and blah, blah, blah. They put it all in writing too, which is really hard to get somebody to retract once they've already printed. And you ask them for proof. I, I throw down the gauntlet now. I'd like to see the proof that earthquakes cannot be forecast. I Really? You're going to tell me you can't do that. You can't prove a negative. So what I'd like you to prove is that earthquakes are completely random. I'd like to see the random distribution of earthquakes in the past week across the United States. And I want to know why it's matching this. And if you can't explain that with your current ideas, you're going to have to adjust your ideas because earthquakes are going across that craton edge. And it's going fours, threes, twos, all the way across the plate. Sometimes the push is big enough that we get fours, fours, and fours all the way across the plate. So it doesn't always diffuse out across the plate. It doesn't always go fours, threes, twos across the plate on the craton. Again, I've seen it in the past. We've seen a 5.4 on the west coast, out off the coast of California. And 12 hours later, a 5.4 strike in Oklahoma. Same day, same 24-hour time period. 5.4 and 5.4. We've seen a 5.9 strike in Southern Colorado on the Craton Edge. And 12 hours later, a 5.9 strike on the Eastern Edge of the Craton in Virginia, same day. You guys remember the 6.0 on the East Coast, that 5.9 that struck back in 2011, right? 12 hours before that, over here on the edge of the Craton, another 5.9 struck. By the way, if you go look that up now, it's a 5.4. They downgraded and downgraded and downgraded it. But it originally rolled in, first report, 5.9, Southern Colorado, knocked chimneys down, knocked facades off houses. Then, 12 hours later, East Coast Virginia got it with its 5.9 next to the nuclear reactor at the Cuckoo Nuclear Power Plant, right next to its high-tension power lines. How about that? <laughs> Pretty wild, man. What a wild, wild... Thing to study, geophysics. Who would have thought that geophysics could become such an exciting topic? I'll remind you now, you should have an earthquake plan. This is just something that's a good idea to do. Develop an emergency kit that'll get you through a couple days. And now, the long-term stuff is a good idea. You know, if you learned anything over the past year of all the other crazy stuff that's been going on around the world, that it's probably a good idea to have longer-term supplies. But I'm just talking about the stuff you're going to grab into like a backpack and go outside for however long it's going to take to withstand the earthquake. You might be in a structure that's going to be okay. So frame houses tend to stay standing even in large earthquakes. But if you're in a brick house or a cinder block house, any kind of stone structure, you're going to need to go outside if the earthquake's significant. And you can't wait around to figure out if the earthquake's going to be significant. That's the problem with stone stack houses. They're not supposed to be moving at all, right? Right? You're in a stone house. It's not supposed to be moving. And so even if it starts moving just a little bit, uh, what's that threshold going to be before the mortar can't withstand? Is it going to be a 4.0 range? Is it going to be a 5.0 range? Because anything above 5, I would even start to get worried myself if I was in the house. So have an exit plan. Pick in a door to go out. And at that door, you have your emergency kit somewhere nearby. So you can just grab it and go outside. You'll have an ID. You'll have a change of clothes, a set of shoes. You'll have your insurance information if you have anything worth insuring. You'll have an extra debit card if you have any extra cash. You'll also have maybe pain medicines, so aspirin and that kind of stuff in case you get injured. Or you might get a headache. And then you might want to also think about first aid and sanitation. Flashlight and batteries is a no-brainer. Also an emergency radio of some kind maybe, so you can tune in and hear what's going on. Especially if the power's out. I'm giving you good ideas, but you will come up with better ones. Think of your kids if you have them. Have a separate bag just for them that they can even maybe carry that has a few things in it for them so they can even maybe carry a couple toys, a few things that might get them through because when all the adults are going into meltdown, you might want to have a few of those things set aside. Also, think of the elderly. Think of your pets 
and think of the disabled. You might even want to have a little bit of extra just in case you come into a barter type situation where somebody else has something that you need and they have something that you want. Okay, we well can change and exchange things if you have a few extras. Or you might be able to help somebody who's in, you know, on their last leg and you could save their life. So think about it. And just thinking about it is way better than what most people will do because most people don't even want to think about it. I'm going to save this as a video. And we are going to upload this over on YouTube. We're going to watch it back. We're going to have some fun. If you're watching on YouTube, I want to give a big shout out to everybody over there who's blown up my channel. Man, you guys have exploded my channel in a good way. Thank you. And everybody on Twitch, dude, you guys are just completely over the top generous. First of all, we get all the Amazon subscriptions, but that's not counting it. I'm talking about you guys just doing it on your own. Thank you. I didn't ask for that. And half the time, I don't even see that I get a notice or anything about people donating subscriptions. But thank you, guys. That really supports my operation, and it makes a big difference. Ah, hold on. People are telling me the East Coast has been hit as I'm talking. Eh, it didn't hit as I was talking, guys. That's older. Hold on. How old is that? Oh, oh, wait, wait. Eight minutes ago? Dude. Okay. Okay, let me, let me put it this way. I was just talking about Virginia and the 5.9 earthquake, right? Let me go show you. Sparta. This is Sparta! <laughs> uh, you could get a shot of me in the moonlight, man, with my buns out there, just, just like Leonidas. Man, my wife wishes I had Leonidas buns. Hell, even I wish I had Leonidas buns. You see that guy? Were those computer animated? I know his, I know his pecs, his pecs and his six pack were computer animated, but was his buns animated? That's the question. And I'm a dude. I'm totally not like like that. And it's all good, dude. It's okay to man crush on that. That's hey, yeah. You got aspirations in life, man. If I could look that good, I'd be great. So here we. <laughs> Oh, I'm sweating. I'm sweating again. Dang. So here we are. We are at Sparta. But really, this is the state line with Virginia. Do you see? Here's Virginia. Oh, we have a hot spot over here in Virginia. Wow. Okay, let's go look at it. Let's go look at the hot spot. See what's at the hot spot. Oh, uh, high tension power lines are there. What else is there? What are these? Little pads scraped in the ground. Oh man, I don't like seeing that. That usually means oil and gas, but in this case, it looks like some kind of chlorine, maybe some exploration for chlorine. We're right next to high tension power lines though, and they are big. These are big sections of high tension power line. So at least double sets. These hotspots showing up next to high tension power lines, you cannot mistake that. Okay, the earthquake striking right here though. The chances of that are so slim. What's this spot here? Oh, well, hold on. Another set of high tension power lines. And they go through the, the forests here, so you can just trace it. You can. That's how you find them easily, guys. Look for the clear cuts in the trees, and then look for the shadows on the towers that carry the electric lines. And then just follow the clear cut. And then that makes it a little easier to find. And there's our hotspot. And again, the hotspots are detected within a mile of, and that's the sensor. The sensor gets it down to within a mile. I'm willing to bet all of these are. So you're having arcing going on at these power lines here as you have earthquake activity come rolling in. I wonder if that's related somehow. Hey, what about these? Yep, more. And again, they're not just like regular power lines, guys. These are the big, long, high-tension kind that, where they only have maybe one per county that goes through a whole county that feeds the whole county. And we're sandwiched right at the, we're right next to them. All right. Interesting. Hey, they just upgraded the earthquake. Man, okay. Now we have to keep going because look, a 3.2 is where they have it now. Or is it a separate quake? Hold on. 
308 and 308. Let's go click on this. The Europeans have it at 3.2. They're telling us to get more info from the USGS. Let's go over to the USGS page. Hold on. Okay. You guys didn't see any of that. Damn. It's okay. It's okay. I didn't have a screen capture turned on. This is all real-time live. You didn't miss too much. Um, all I did was zoom in on this and show you high-tension power lines. That's it. That's all you missed. So, for instance, this right here, you missed that. Sorry, guys. I didn't realize the display capture was turned off. And down here. I guess I should read chat more. Here's another set of high-tension power lines. Double ones. So I just mentioned it again. I spent like five minutes looking it up just to show you that, okay? That's all you missed, quite literally. Uh, let's go and see. So now they, the Europeans have it at 3.2. That matters because of the 3.2 over in the Midwest. But the chance of any earthquake striking over in Virginia, as I'm looking it up or talking about Virginia, Virginia is a rare earthquake location to begin with. It doesn't get hit every week, sometimes not even every month. And for it to get hit while I'm talking about it, it's, it's just, statistically speaking, we're trying to get, I mean, we're down within a 200-mile area that there's 200, 200 million square miles on the planet. And for me to get it down to a 200-mile stretch here where I'm talking about it, and this is 200 miles from the 5.9 that I was talking about here to where this 3.2 is, that if I'm talking about this area right in here, and then right next to it gets hit while I'm talking about it, it's a one in a million chance for that to happen. Because there's 200 million square miles on the planet. To get it down to 200, obviously, 200 goes into 200 million, one million times. That's one in a million chance. And this has happened enough in the past several updates where I'm showing an area, it doesn't matter where I'm at on the planet, and all of a sudden, ding, an earthquake hits at that spot. It's starting to get weird. Freaky. I would start to think that maybe somebody at the USGS was populating earthquakes in areas where I'm looking on purpose. Because statistically, it's now happened six times in the last three updates. That's like winning six state lotteries in the last week. And I'm talking full jackpot here. One in a million chance for one. And we have six examples in the last just several updates. So again, there's something weird about that, and I don't know what to think about it, other than I start to question the earthquakes themselves. Because the other chance that I'm some kind of grand poobah of earthquakes where I've got, you know, let me, maybe I need a crystal ball at this point. Um, but yeah, that's, that's just a little weird. Okay, now we can get out of here. We can finally sign off. You didn't get to see the last tail end of it. A little bit frustrating. Oh, well, keeps you watching. A little bit outraged. You'll be back if you like me enough. And if not, hey, go have a good weekend and be safe. I'll be back if anything else goes down. Look out for this as a video over on YouTube in just a little bit.